Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janaballa Bhagiri Varadhari Jaya Gopi Janaballa Bhagiri Varadhari Jashodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Jashodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Jashodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vannachari Jamuna Tira Vannachari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahangsa Pri Rajaka Chariyastu Tarasata Shri Shimad. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda Ki Jai. Nama Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai. Prem Sekaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Rueta Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaurav Bhaktivrinda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gop Gopinath Shyama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Ki Jai. Shri Brindavan Dham Ki Jai. Shri Mayapur Dham Ki Jai. Ganga Mai Jamun Mai Ki Jai. Gaur Premanandi. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Ram Nomi. All glories to Lotus Feeder Shri Shri Guru and Gauranga Haribo.
Since we usually, do we still do that on Saturday? We read the whole uh, Brahma Samhita sometimes. Anyway, let's do one verse, the one that goes, Rama Adi Murti Shukala Niyamena Tishtan. I know, I have to find it first. Hare Krishna. Oh wait, here it is. It's verse number Rāmādi-mūrti-śukalāni-yamena-tiṣṭhāṁ Nānā-vatāra-makaro-bhūpanesu-kintu Govinda Madi Purushang Tamahang Pajami I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who manifested himself personally as Krishna and the different avatars in the world in the forms of Rama, Nrsimha, Vamana, etc., as his subjective portions. Purport. His subjective portions as the avatars, namely Rama, etc., appear from Vaikuntha, and his own form Krishna manifests himself with Braja in this world from Goloka. The underlying sense is that Krishna Chaitanya, identical with Krishna himself, also brings about by his appearance the direct manifestation of Godhead himself. Hare Krishna. So before we start the class, any discussion of this verse, anyone? It's interesting that he mentions Lord Chaitanya, that Lord Chaitanya himself, we don't understand Krishna or Krishna's pastimes or, Krishna or the bhakti, a devotional service, the mellows of bhakti, a devotional service, except for the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. He's come in this Kali Yuga and uh, he's brought this great uh, chanting for deliverance and he displayed the bhava of Srimati Radharani and enjoyed that himself because the enjoyment of uh, the gopis and especially Srimati Radharani is millions of times greater than the enjoyment of Krishna. This is, so he wanted to taste that and he wanted to know about himself what Radharani saw in him. So these were some of the internal reasons uh, that he appeared as described by Krishna Das Kaviraj. Krishna Das Kaviraj, Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita, that the uh, Aracharyas are singing that if we want to understand the pastimes of Radha and Krishna, uh, we have to get the mercy of Lord Nityananda, right? Nitai Pada Kamala, you know that song, right? Hena Nitai Bine Bhai, Radha Krishna Paite Nai. Actually, we have to get the mercy of the six Goswamis before and uh, and, of course, the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. So, and the same is true for the <coughs> avatars, Lord Rama, and the other avatars that come in this world. To really properly understand, we need to get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. So, uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam today, ninth canto, chapter 10, verse 11. Let's read one verse. And purport. Chapter 10, the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya, I mean of Lord Ramachandra, excuse me. And verse number 11. Raksho Adhamena Vrikavad Vipine 
asamaksham Rakshodhamena brikavad vipine samaksham Vaideha Raja Duhitari Apayapitayam Vaideha Raja Duhitari Apayapitayam Pratra Bane Kripanavat Priyaya Priyaya Vyuktaha Pratra Bane Kripanavat Priyaya Vyuktaha Stri Sanginam Gatimiti Pratayang Chachara Stri Sanghi Nam Gatimiti Pratayang Chachara Rakshod Hamena Brikavad Vipine Samaksham Vaide Haraja Duhitarya Paya Piyam Pitayam Excuse me Tayam Pratravane Kripanavat Priya Vyuktaha Stri Sanginanga Timati Pratayang Chachara Bolo Rakshod Hamena Brikavad Vipine Samaksham Vaide Haraja Duhitarya Payati Pratravane Kripanavat Priyayavi Yuktaha Sri Sangham Sri Sanghinam Gatimiti Pratayam Shachara Sri Sanghinam Gatimiti Pratayam Shachara Anyone else? Rakshodhamena Vikavad Vipine Samaksham Rakshodhamena Vikavad Vipine Samaksham Vede Haraja Duhitari Apayapitayam Vede Haraja Duhitari Apayapitayam Bratra Vane Kripanavat Priya Vyuktaha Bratra Vane Kripanavat Priya Vyuktaha Sri Sanghi Nam Gati Miti Pratayam Shachara Sri Sanghi Nam Gati Miti Pratayam Shachara Raksha Adhamena by the most wicked among Rakshasas, Ravana. Vrikavat, like a tiger. Vipine, in the forest. Asamaksham, unprotected. Vaideha Raja Duhitari. By this condition of Mother Sita, the daughter of the king of Videha. Apayapitayam, having been kidnapped. Bratra, with his brother, Vane, in the forest. Kripanavat, as if a very distressed person. Priyaya, by his dear wife. Vyuktaha, separated. Stri Sanginam, of persons attracted to or connected with women. Gatim, destination, iti, thus, pratayan, giving an example, chachara, wandered. Translation, when Ramachandra entered the forest and Lakshmana was also absent, the worst of the rakshasas, Ravana, kidnapped Sita Devi, the daughter of the king of Videha, just as a tiger seizes unprotected sheep when the shepherd is absent. 
Then Lord Ramachandra wandered in the forest with his brother Lakshmana, as if very much distressed due to separation from his wife. Thus he showed by his personal example the condition of a person attached to women. Please repeat. When Ramachandra entered the forest, and Lakshmana was also absent, the worst of the Rakshasas, Ravana, kidnapped Sita Devi, the daughter of the king of Videha. Just as a tiger seizes unprotected sheep when the shepherd is absent. Then Lord Ramachandra wandered in the forest with his brother Lakshmana as if very much distressed due to separation from his wife. Thus he showed by his personal example the condition of a person attached to women. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In this verse, the words Sri Sanginam Gatim Iti indicate that the condition of a person attached to women was shown by the Lord himself. According to moral instructions, Grihe Narim Vivar Jayet, when one goes on a tour, one should not bring his wife. Formerly, men used to travel without conveyances, but still, as far as possible, when one leaves home, one should not take his wife with him, especially if one is in such a condition as Lord Ramachandra when banished by the order of his father. Whether in the forest or at home, if one is attached to women, this attachment is always troublesome, as shown by the Supreme Personality of Godhead by his personal example. Of course, this is the material side of Sri Sangi, but the situation of Lord Ramachandra is spiritual, for he does not belong to the material world. Narayana paro vyaktat. Narayan is beyond the material creation. Because he is the creator of the material world, he is not subject to the conditions of the material world. The separation of Lord Ramachandra from Sita is spiritually understood as vipralambha, which is an activity of the hladini potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, belonging to the Sringara rasa, rasa, the mellow of conjugal love in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has all the dealings of love, displaying the symptoms called sattvika, sanchari, vilapa, murcha, and unmada. Thus, when Lord Ramachandra was separated from Sita, all these spiritual symptoms were manifested. The Lord is neither impersonal nor impotent. Rather, he is Sachidananda Vigraha, the eternal form of knowledge and bliss. Thus, he has all the symptoms of spiritual bliss. Feeling separation from one's beloved is also an item of spiritual bliss. As explained by Srila Swarup Damodar Goswami, Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritir, Ladini Shaktihi. The dealings of love between Radha and Krishna are displayed as the pleasure potency of the Lord. The Lord is the original source of all pleasure, the reservoir of all pleasure. Lord Ramachandra therefore manifested the truth, both spiritually and materially. Materially, those who are attached to women suffer, but spiritually, when there are feelings of separation between the Lord and his pleasure potency, the spiritual bliss of the Lord increases. This is further explained in Bhagavad Gita. Avajananti mang mudha manushing tanum ashritam Parang bhavam ajananto mamabhuta maheshwaram. One who does not know the spiritual potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead thinks of him, thinks of the Lord as an ordinary human being. But the Lord's mind, intelligence, and senses can never be affected by material conditions. This fact is further explained in the Skanda Purana, as quoted by <coughs> Madhvacharya. Nitya purna sukhagyana swarupo sau yato vibhuhu. Atosya rama itya kya tasya dukham kuton vapi tatapi loka shikshartam adhukto dukhadvartivat antarhitang loka drishtya sitam asit smaraniva jnana partang punarnitya sambandha svatmanakshriyaha ayodhyaya vinir gachan sarva lokasya cheshvaraha pratyakshang to Shriya Sardham, Jagaman Nadir Avyayaha, Nakshatramasa Ganitang, Trayodasha, 
Sahasrakam, Brahma Loka Samang Chakre Samastang Shiti Mandalam, Rama Ramo Rama Iti Sarve Sham Apavatada Sarvo Ramaman Ramamayo Loko Yada Ramas Tupalayat. It was actually impossible for Ravana to take away Sita. The form of Sita taken by Ravana was the, an illusory representation of Mother Sita, Maya Sita. When Sita was tested in the fire, this Maya Sita was burnt and the real Sita came out of the fire. A further understanding to be derived from this example is that a woman, however powerful she may be in the material world, must be given protection, for as soon as she is unprotected, she will be exploited by rakshasas like Ravana. Here the words Vaideha Raja Duhitari indicate that before Mother Sita was married to Lord Ramachandra, she was protected by her father, Vaideha Raja. And when she was married, she was protected by her husband. Therefore, the conclusion is that a woman should always be protected. According to the Vedic rule, there is no scope for a woman's being independent, asamaksham, for a woman cannot protect herself independently. Om Ajnana Timaran Dhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militangyena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitangyena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavangsha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitang Tang Sajivam Sadvetam Sabadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitang He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Mukam Koroti Bachalam Pangum Langai Tegirim Tet Kripa Tamahang Vande Shri Guru Dinataranam so the Lord is very clever, that's one of his qualities, which means he can do many things at once, accomplish many, many different things at once. So when the Lord appears as Rama, as Krishna, and as the other avatars, he can uh, both satisfy um, his uh, spiritual internal um, motives and also uh, do other things like set a, a moral uh, ideal. <clears throat> when I was distributing books one time in Santa Cruz and uh, a group of sort of intellectual people came up to talk to me and they were arguing that, uh, that the, of course they didn't really know Bhagavad Gita. I was trying to distribute Bhagavad Gita. They didn't really know. But they assumed that it had to be taken as fiction. I guess in um, Christianity or Western religion, history of religion, there's always an argument about what part of the scriptures is allegorical and what part is actually um, historical. And uh, fundamentalists say it's all historical and Adam and Eve were, you know, created in the garden and everything. And that it's considered a, it's considered a, a naive approach to scripture. So they were saying that the, the battle of Kurukshetra didn't really happen but that it, was, um, it must be some allegorical thing. And I said, no, it really happened, but, um, but Krishna can do things in his, when he does things that uh, he's so artistic. Like they say that, uh, what did they say? That uh, art imitates life or life imitates art or both. 
And I say, he can actually do things uh, and speak this perfect poetry right before a battle. And, um, and it really happened, and yet at the same time, you can, you can take some uh, meanings from it and see different meanings from it. So they weren't satisfied. They were... <laughs> Because it's very, it's very prominent nowadays. We're in Kali Yuga and it's very prominent for people to have an atheistic mentality. Right? Uh, as uh, Srila Prabhupada quoted this verse from Bhagavad Gita, Avajananti mang mudha manushing tanamashritam param bhava majananto mama bhuta maheshwaram. The activities of Lord Krishna or Lord Rama in this world are, are difficult to understand for non devotees. And uh, some people think that the Lord is just a human being. Um, and, and then there's exaggerated stories told about them, and they criticize the stories. Or other people think it's just a fictional character. The Valmiki was just a poet that was making up some uh, moral allegory. I actually went to up in um, Mount Madonna, Baba Haridas, um, has a, an ashram up there and there's a school. It's a vegetarian school, it's a very good school. Uh, and uh, they have a good drama department and the kids put on plays, the high school kids put on really good plays. But every year they put on a Ramayana play and they passed out a, um, a pamphlet to us when I went to see the play. And it said, these activities of course didn't really happen Right? There really weren't talking monkeys and bears and, and giant demons and things like that. But it's an allegory from which we can learn uh, experiences of Dharma. So I was very disappointed to see that. They were doing that. And Baba Haridas was right there. Uh, he had a vow of silence. I think he wrote on a slate or whatever. But he was right there and they passed out this pamphlet. I was very sorry to see that... Um, uh, because even yogis without bhakti, without proper understanding, without the grace of Lord Chaitanya, uh, then they're being described by Krishna and Bhagavad Gita as fools, that they don't understand his activities, which are very, very difficult to understand, and he accomplishes different things with them. So in this purport, it's interesting. Um, on the one hand, um, one might say that... Uh, Rama shouldn't have taken Sita into the forest with him. That, um, at least in Vedic culture, um, women are to be protected and they're not sub to be subjected to the hardships of uh, life in the forest. Um, and of course, Sita could not live without Rama and Rama could not live without Sita. And... Uh, and, of course, she insisted on going to the forest with him. Um, and his attachment to Sita is not some material attachment for his own... Com the difference between material attachment and spiritual attachment uh, has to be properly understood. People also criticize Krishna that he danced with gopis who were married to other men and that he was immoral and this was a bad example. They wanted to be some... You know, Krishna gives examples of morality. He says that he doesn't have any duties to perform. Name partasti kartavyam trishulokeshu kinchana nanavaptam avaptavyam varta eva chakarmani. That he's telling Arjuna that one should practice one's duty according to regulations and that everyone should do that. And he says that even a liberated person who doesn't have any requirement to do that should still do it to set a good example. And then he says, look at me. I created everything. I don't have anything to do. Nobody's, nobody's requiring anything of me. But still, if I didn't follow principles like getting married and having children in the proper way, living li properly like a proper member of the princely order, then I would set a bad example for everyone and everyone would follow my example and people would go have children out of wedlock. Unwanted children would create a population of people who couldn't understand or practice uh, self-control and higher principles and the whole world would be ruined like that. So he said, I set a good example. I, even I follow regulative principles. But then in the pastime of the gopis, he's breaking regulative principles, right? He's, but Krishna can do that. He's showing a higher principle. He's showing something very, very special. He's actually showing 
the ultimate goal of life, which is Prem, and how he loves his devotees. And, um, and that's going on also in the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra. So uh, when Navina Narada asked me what I would speak about today, I told him I would take on this difficult subject of the Uttarakhanda, which uh, disturbs a lot of people. How could Lord Rama, um, because of some washerman, that he hears a washerman criticizing his wife um, and comparing Sita uh, to an unchaste woman and comparing Rama to a henpecked, cuckolded husband, uh, because of that, for the sake of properly maintaining the kingdom, um, he banishes Sita to the forest. She's pregnant. And um, it seems so uh, immoral and cruel um, that people have a hard time with it. And... Um, Mundane scholars often criticize. Sometimes they say it must be made up. It wasn't, should, shouldn't have been part of the original. But here it is in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's also mentioned. And, um, or there's a professor of Sanskrit at Berkeley, uh, Professor Sutherland, who often um, teaches that, you know, th these are bad examples from the Vedas that teach uh, um, mistreatment of women you know, from a feminist perspective. Of course, to understand them as endorsing mistreatment of women would be wrong. That's not, the Vedas don't endorse any adharma, and that would be a mistake. But um, Lord Rama is doing this because he's the personality of Godhead, and Sita is also his, uh, his uh, consort, his moiti. His, she's also, Sita Rama is the personality of Godhead together, and um, and they're exp expressing their loving pastimes in this way. Now, there's also a moral side, a moral instruction, uh, which is that uh, the king, a king uh, has a duty to his citizens, to the responsibility to govern so much that he has to put aside his uh, personal life and sometimes has to do things uh, that would be immoral. Uh, and uh, so that instruction could be taken. I mean, Rama, the whole pastime of Ram, Ramayana is how much he loved Sita, that he couldn't be separated. Then when she was kidnapped, in the mood of separation, he was striving to uh, rescue her. Of course, Sita could have killed Ravana and all his armies by herself, but, uh, and she told that to Ravana one time. But actually, because this is the pastimes of the Lord, it, he would kill Ravana in his own time after making all these alliances with um, the forest uh, army and so forth. So he loved Sita so much, although Lord Krishna, when he came, he married 16,108 princesses. Um, Lord Rama took a vow of Ekapatni, one wife, and he was so dedicated to Sita. Of course, this is the personality of Godhead and his internal potency. So that love is the strongest love in the world. And then, uh, when they were separated, he had great feelings of vipralamba, separation. And then, uh, after he rescued her, and he even tested her, and knew that she was uh, chaste, of course he knew anyway, but for everyone's benefit, he established that uh, she had been chaste the whole time, even though kidnapped by another man. And then they were happily reunited. And then again, they were separated, this time by this decision to banish her to the forest. Now people would think, oh, how cruel of Rama. And she has to go to the forest, and he gets to stay and enjoy the kingdom and the comforts of, of being a king and having servants in the palace. And she has to go somehow fend for herself while she's pregnant and walk among the thorns where there's wild animals and, and no creature comforts and somehow or another get food. Um, 
That would be a superficial misunderstanding that banishing by Rama of Sita uh, was very painful. For, we can imagine how painful it was for Rama. So this was this pain is spiritual ecstasy called Vipralamba. And similarly, Sita was all in favor of it. It wasn't like she was um, uh, protesting, how can you mistreat me this way or something. She's so dedicated. Her love for Rama is such that uh, she worshipped, continued to worship Rama in exile and uh, took shelter of Valmiki Muni and her children were born and because she could not live in separation from Rama, she wasn't concerned at all about her own reputation, that it seemed like he had banished her because she had been unchaste or anything like that. But because she couldn't live in separation from Rama, she entered the earth. And, um, and Rama felt great separation from her. So the external moral instruction might be there, this kind of Machiavellian instruction uh, of course, normally the pastimes of Rama is that he's so ideal that he always keeps his word, he keeps his vow, he protects his father's vow, he does even to these ultimate extremes. And in this case, he's concerned about um, um, maintaining the, how should you say, the public opinion to the ultimate extreme. There's a saying that the uh, the wife of Caesar has to be uh, uh, above suspicion. We, we use that in legal ethics also, that a lawyer doesn't just have to make sure he doesn't do anything wrong, but he has to avoid even the appearance of impropriety um, because the wife of Caesar has to be above suspicion. And similarly, the, the wife of King Rama, if the foolish populace started to um, believe that um, she had been unchaste, then that would be bad for the um, government. So it's an extreme example. Uh, it's not, if we understand it to say, well, this is right, we should banish our own wives even when they're innocent or something like that, that would be a gross misunderstanding or that we should be cruel. Um, and uh, that would be a gross misunderstanding. But the, uh, but the, Moral instruction is that the king puts um, his duty to the to the to govern the the uh, citizens, the subjects, uh, so high that he sacrifices even his own uh, personal uh, happiness and even his own sometimes have even his own personal morality. Arjuna also, when he was going to fight the battle of Kurukshetra, he was making moral arguments: How can we kill our guru? How can we kill our grandfather Bhishma? How can we counteract with arrows those who are our superiors? That will cause us to go to hell. This is uh, immoral behavior. And, and it is. Of course, it was immoral on either side, right? For him to uh, not uphold his duty to fight would have also been immoral, Krishna explains to him. Um, and anyway, if uh, this is actually what you're required to do, what I require you to do, uh, I'll protect you. There won't be any sin involved. But Krishna says to Arjuna that everyone must do his duty even though it's covered by some fault. And sometimes, so this is what uh, Machiavelli had written. I think that the Villa Vrindavan in Italy, I'm not sure, it was either Dante or Machiavelli had once uh, owned that property or stayed at that property or something. But he had written that um, sometimes a king has to be ruthless for the good of the citizens. So he's often misunderstood and is, he seems to be justifying that people can be immoral. But what he's saying is that sometimes, and Srila Prabhupada points that out, sometimes a merchant has to tell lies in order to conduct his business. Oh, you're such a good customer. For you, I won't make any profit. But we should know that he's lying. Of course, nowadays we get these robocalls from people who are absolutely scoundrels who are telling us, trying to steal from us. They should go to jail if we could catch them. But, but even an honest merchant can't be thoroughly honest. Or an honest king sometimes has to be diplomatic. And, and um, 
um, you know, for the sake of protecting his uh, citizens. And in this case, that's the superficial example, and it's an extreme example that he does something so horrible, in a way, um, to show how much he cares about uh, protecting the, the uh, public opinion in his kingdom. But that's not the main thing that's going on here, and that's not the main lesson. And what's really going on is that uh, that Lord Ramachandra is uh, demonstrating this mood of separation, vipralamba. That this is the this is the ultimate flowering of love. That this is part of prema. This is part of spiritual love. So Srila Prabhupada is in the purport we just read. Srila Prabhupada was talking about how uh, the same example, <clears throat> a man attached to a woman, can be taken on the material side to show how um, it can cause suffering, that the um, yogis should be detached, they can become sannyasis and take a vow of celibacy and go to the forest, this is encouraged. And at the same time, it's also teaching the uh, spiritual love that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has with his internal pleasure potency, with his, with his internal potency, and that it's an arrangement of the pleasure potency that they sometimes are separated, and then they experience um, this grief that how, they, how can they live being separated from one another, and it appears to be grief to ordinary people, but actually um, it's a kind of spiritual ecstasy. And... Um, it's a very important part of devotional service that Lord Chaitanya um, taught. Lord Chaitanya stayed in Nilachala for the last 18 years of his life and relished these ecstasies of Radharani's Mahabhav and uh, would speak in madness. How can I go on living without Krishna? I'm like a fly, he said, and I go on even for a moment breathing and eating, maintaining my body even though Krishna is not present. This is his, his ecstatic feelings of separation. These were experienced by Srimati Radharani when Krishna left Vrindavan. And she had to go on living because she knew that uh, Krishna would be displeased if she left her body or left the world. But uh, at the same time, it was this unbearable separation from Krishna. So this Vipralamba, I can't speak from realization. I'm just a neophyte devotee. But it, I hear from our acharyas that it has different, um, different levels, different aspects. And if we read Bhaktivinoda Thakur or some of these other acharyas, uh, even Srila Prabhupada describes in detail in Chaitanya Charitamrita a lot about it. Um, and we can hear and repeat what we've heard. Uh, I won't get into the, on the science of it, but I can say that all the Acharyas are saying that uh, for us to actually meet Krishna, go back to Godhead and live with Krishna, um, we have to experience this intense uh, ecstasy of separation from Krishna. We have to experience this feeling that now that he's not present before me, um, I can't tolerate it, and I'm going to cry, and I'm going to uh, um, somehow. Um, even we have the we have the song about the departed Vaishnavas, and and Naratam Das Thakur says, "I'll enter into fire, I'll bash my head against a stone." So we have this this feeling of spiritual love. Now, this in the, on the material side, if someone is doing that, that would be uh, show uh, a great foolish attachment that's leading him into a very sinful activity. But on the spiritual side, it's it's ecstasy. Just like people criticize Krishna for dancing with the gopis, they don't understand that the gopis' relationship with Krishna is totally spiritual, and that it's not it's not at all tinged with selfishness or or biological, you know, um, sense gratification. It's really um, completely an affair of love. In fact, I wanted to read something from that about Vipralamba. Of course, 
you all know that um, the gopis, uh, they came and they met Krishna in the forest and they were feeling very, very fortunate. And then they got a little bit proud. And because of that, Krishna disappeared. And um, the gopis went searching for Krishna and they offered some very beautiful songs that uh, the devotees, sometimes I've heard them reciting here in our, in our, this kind of Silicon Valley. And then eventually Krishna comes back and he satisfies them and he pleases them. This is in Canto 10, chapter 32, called The Reunion. But because the gopis were still a little bit resentful that he had, he had disappeared and caused them so much uh, anxiety, they asked him this question in text number 16. Ch Canto 10, chapter 32, text number 16. Shri Gopya Uchuhu, Bajato Nubhajantyeka, Eka Etad, Viparyayam, Nobhayang Shabhajantyeka, Eta no Bruhi Sadhu, Boho. So they're asking Krishna this question. The gopi said, Some people reciprocate the affection only of those who are affectionate toward them, while others show affection even to those who are indifferent or inimical. And yet others will not show affection toward anyone. Dear Krishna, please properly explain this matter to us. Purport by this apparently polite question, the gopis want to expose Lord Krishna's failure to properly reciprocate their love. They were very disturbed when Sri Krishna left them in the forest and they want to know why he caused them to suffer these loving affairs. So they're affectionate towards him, even though they, he's apparently not being affectionate towards them. Ashlish Shiva Padaratang Panashtumam. The the um, uh, Shikshastakam prayer. Nadarshanam. Ashlish Shiva Padaratang Panashtumam. Adarshanam Papa. Yatatata Vavadatatu Lampato Mat Prananatas to Sevanapra. So Lord Radharani is explaining Lord Chaitanya's expressing this um, unconditional, abject condition of lover who loves uh, the Lord so much that even if he's indifferent, uh, she can't help but just love him. So, the Supreme Personality of God had said, so-called friends who show affection for each other only to benefit themselves are actually selfish. They have no true f friendship nor are they following the true principles of religion. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam is teaching about real spiritual love. Dharma kaitava projita kaitava tra paramonia matsaranam satam. That when, when, um, when uh, Lord Nishringadev told Prahlad Maharaj to take some boon, Prahlad Maharaj first said, My Lord, I love you because you're the personality of Godhead and I'm your servant. I don't, I don't love you because I want something in return. Most mundane religion, they teach you, if you do this, then you'll be rewarded. If you do that, you'll be punished. And, and it's all about uh, reciprocation. So, he, so Prahlad Maharaj said, I'm not a banik. I'm not a merchant doing some business transaction with you. I'm, I love you. Indeed, if they did not expect benefit for themselves, they would not reciprocate, purport. The Lord here reminds the gopis that in pure loving friendship there is no sense of selfish interest, but rather only love for one's friend. My dear slender wasted gopis, some people are genuinely merciful or like parents naturally affectionate. Such persons who devotedly serve even those who fail to reciprocate with them are following the true faultless path of religion and they are true well-wishers. Then there are those individuals who are spiritually self-satisfied materially fulfilled or by nature ungrateful or simply envious of superiors. Such persons will not love even those who love them, what to speak of those who are inimical. Purport, some people being spiritually self-satisfied do not reciprocate others' affection because they want to avoid entanglement in mundane dealings. Other persons do not reciprocate simply out of envy or arrogance and still others fail to reciprocate because they are materially satisfied and then thus uninterested in new material opportunities. 
Lord Krishna patiently explains all these things to the gopis. And now, text 20. The reason I do not immediately reciprocate the affection of living beings, even when they worship me, O gopis, is that I want to intensify their loving devotion. Then they become like a poor man who has gained some wealth and then lost it, and who thus becomes so anxious about it that he can think of nothing else. Purport, Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, ye man prapadyante tangs tataiva bhajamyaham. As people approach me, I reciprocate with them accordingly. Yet even if the Lord is approached by someone with devotion to intensify the devotee's love, the Lord may not immediately reciprocate fully. In fact, the Lord is truly reciprocating. After all, a sincere devotee always prays to the Lord, please help me to love you purely. Therefore, the Lord's so-called neglect is actually the fulfillment of the devotee's prayer. Lord Krishna intensifies our love for him by apparently separating himself from us. And the result is that we achieve what we really wanted and prayed for, intense love for the absolute truth, Krishna. Thus, Lord Krishna's apparent negligence is actually his thoughtful reciprocation and the fulfillment of our deepest and purest desire. According to the Acharyas, as Lord Krishna began to speak this verse, the gopis looked at one another with squinting eyes, trying to hide the smiles breaking out on their faces. Even as the Lord Krishna was speaking, the gopis had begun to realize that he was bringing them to the highest perfection of loving service. So this is what the devotees really want. They want the highest perfection of love, and Krishna makes that arrangement, sometimes by apparently neglecting them and bringing out the feelings of separation. My dear girls, understanding that simply for my sake you had rejected the authority of worldly opinion of the Vedas and of your relatives, I acted as I did only to increase your attachment to me. Even when I removed myself from your sight by suddenly disappearing, I never stopped loving you. Therefore, my beloved gopis, please do not harbor any bad feelings toward me, your beloved. Purport. Here the Lord indicates that though the gopis were already perfect in their love for him, still, to inconceivably increase their perfection and show an example for the world, he acted as he did. So I said earlier that even to first meet Krishna in person to go to a planet where Krishna is and meet him, we need to have uh, that qualification at least of that um, vipralamba, that, that crying for his association that we can't, we can't tolerate being separated from him. But even beyond that, there's other stages of vipralamba that the perfected devotees in, uh, relish and uh, Sita Devi is relishing. Um, this Vipralamba. And Lord Rama is reciprocating and giving her the opportunity to relish this uh, love in separation, which is a kind of spiritual ecstasy, although it appears very painful externally. So the chapter ends with this famous verse Napara yeham niravadya sangyujam svasadhu krityang vibhuyash vibudhayu sapivaha. Ya ma bhajan durjara geha shrinkalaha samvrishya tadva pratiyatu sadhuna. I am not able to repay my debt for your spotless service, even within a lifetime of Brahma. Your connection with me is beyond reproach. You have worshipped me, cutting off all domestic ties which are difficult to break. Therefore, please let your own glorious deeds be your compensation. Purport. The translation and word meanings for this verse are taken from Srila Prabhupada's English rendering of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, chapter 4, verse 180. In conclusion, the gopis became eternally glorious by their behavior in the Lord's temporary absence, and the mutual love between them and the Lord was wonderfully enhanced. This is the perfection of Krishna and his loving devotees. So Lord Chaitanya has uh, confirmed that the um, best devotees and the best method of worshiping Krishna um, is shown by the gopis, that they are the best devotees and that their, their method of worshiping Krishna is the actual highest method of worshiping Krishna. And this pastime of Lord Ramachandra that is so difficult to understand for those who don't have bhakti and don't, can't, I mean, how could they possibly understand that his banishing her to the forest was actually an act of 
um, supreme love and the full flowering of their loving ecstasy. Uh, it's very difficult to understand that. It's very mysterious. But these are not some stories written by some poet. Uh, these are actually the activities of God when he appears on earth. And he does these things, and it's up, it's up to us to understand them, not criticize them and think, oh, it should have been done a different way or it should have been described a different way. Uh, it's actually up to us to really understand what's going on there, um, even though it's very difficult. So um, I could go on, but uh, let's have a little discussion at this point. Uh, it's kind of a heavy topic, I think, and it's like I said, it's uh, I don't experience this ecstasy of like feeling that I can't maintain my life without uh, Krishna's presence, and so I'm speaking about what I've heard. But but I um, when I hear it, it I, by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, I can understand it a little bit, even though it's even though I'm not that advanced yet to to actually um, have those emotions that way. Maybe some of you are. And uh, so let's have some discussion. We have some microphones out there. Yes, sir. Have two, two in the middle. So as, as mentioned here, um, it's the proper thing to have, uh, to have um, woman protected by father or husband. So when um, when Lord Rama banished Sita, she should have been protected by someone, like she, like Janaka was still around. So that principle is kind of not being upheld at the end. It seems like he's yeah he wasn't following even the the rule. His beloved Sita Devi, not just anyone, but his beloved Sita Devi, who had been so much uh, perfect in every way, goddess of fortune and the perfect wife. And he wasn't even looking after her protection when he banished her. He didn't. Um, did, did, no, he sent Lakshman, didn't he? Send Lakshman with her. No. Halfway, halfway, Lakshman went, and then. So. Uh, yeah. So he could have sent her back to her father or something. So anyway, this is the pastime that she was able to stay with. Uh, with Valmiki and he was able to learn all the pastimes of Ramayana and Kusha and Lava, the celebrated Brahmachari sons. Uh, they also um, got to be raised in an ashram of the sage. And, um, and he understood, being the personality of Godhead, of course he understood everything that was going on. In fact, he was arranging everything that was going on. So, But you might say that from the mundane side, as an example of morality, it looks it looks like a very bad example, right? I mean, even a Vedic Dharma, that a woman is always supposed to be protected. He shouldn't have even taken her to the forest where he was subjected her to the danger of not only the hardships of forest life, but also the danger of uh, being kidnapped by a Rakshasa. And... Uh, from the mundane perspective, and Krishna shouldn't have been dancing with the gopis. But that's what people think, that these are human pastimes, and that uh, they're lusty pastimes, and Krishna, when Krishna dances with the gopis, it's something like when um, mundane people, humans, engage in illicit sex. But it's not anything like that. And the gopis, here's an example that we were just reading, that the gopis' love for Krishna was... Uh, so pure, they didn't have any concern for themselves at all or for their own gratification at all. They gave up their their morality, the opinion of everyone. They gave up everything just to please Krishna. And that was the perfection of their love, that they really just, uh, their only interest was pleasing Krishna. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything at all like illicit sex, even though it appears like that. So Krishna das Kaviraj, and even Sukadeva Goswami in Bhagavatam is, careful to point. King Pariksit is bewildered by it and asks about it and he points it out. But in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj explains more that, you know, iron is gold, uh, iron is metal and gold is metal, but they're two different things and that one is completely different from the other, even though they both may appear to be the same because they're both metal. And similarly, the spiritual love that Rama was showing with Sita even when he banished her, which seems like he's 
um, mistreating her is actually of a different quality than when if some if some ordinary person did that to his wife, which would never be done. So it's a good point. It, Wait, uh, have uh, Hare Krishna Babu, thank you for the nice discourse. Uh, I was just remembering there was one other external reason, probably mentioned in Gag Samhita, that uh, uh, Radharani was cursed, I don't know whether by Piraja or by Tulsi Frinda Devi, that you will have to, you know, um, endure separation from your beloved three times. And then it happened once with Rama and Sita, and then when Rama was taking Sita somewhere, then said that in this lifetime you will be banished, but in one lifetime I will be banished. And that happened with Lord Chaitan, he banished himself mm. from family life. And I think uh, in Radha Krishna's also there was hundred years of separation right between them. And then Lord Chaitanya's pastime is the third pastime where they had the separation. So, mm. that so where is, is the where is the is this from the six Goswamis or where is it? Said I think Prabhu it's in Garg Samhita mentioned. Yeah, Garg Samhita. Yeah, I know that when uh, they do the um, parikram in in Navadweep, then they go to Modadruma Dweep. There's a place there where Lord Lord Rama and Sita came when they were exiled, and uh, and then Rama started smiling. And uh, Sita was curious why he was smiling, and he said that in the wonderful age of Kali Yuga, um, he said, this place is very special to me, and in the wonderful age of Kali Yuga, I'll come again, and you'll come here, and I'll leave you crying on the lap of my mother, and I will go become a sannyasi. So, yes, there's this... This uh, three separations as Rama, Krishna, and then as Lord Chaitanya, that he again uh, uh, performed that pastime. So that's in the Garga Samhita. I'll look that up. Hare Krishna, you had something? Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you for guiding us through this sensitive topic. This might be a mundane view, but for me, when I hear of these pastimes where something that seems so overwhelmingly terrible happens, and like all throughout Ramayan, this is happening from like how Kakei was raised and what, like the whole thing, these reversals, for me, it's like a bit of refuge to see a bigger picture, because in my own life, I'm sure in all of our lives, we have these reversals where something happens that just seems so overwhelmingly terrible. And to take refuge in these stories, these pastimes of, oh, well, it happened to Sita, it happened to Kaikei, it, you know, it happened again and again. And it wasn't actually such a terrible thing. We just have to wait to see what happens next. Yeah, of course, that famous verse, Hridvagva um, Purpur, Tatenu Kampam Susumikshuano, Bunjana Evat Makritang Vipakam, Hridvagva Purpur, Yata At Vidhan Namaste, Jiveta Yo Mukti Pades Vidhaya Bhak. Yeah, that things are happening to us, but the devotees continue worshipping the Lord. Right? Sita didn't feel. Of course, this, this Professor Sutherland was saying, you know, that this is a bad example for Hindu women, that they're given these examples of Draupadi and Sita and things, and they're taught to be, to uh, accept injustices against themselves and things like that. And she, I'll admit, you know, people shouldn't be, commit injustices against each other and people shouldn't tolerate it. And, and if we had real dharmic leadership, people wouldn't be mistreated. But um, but she's giving the example of how a devotee feels that reversals happen in life. People get sick. Everybody dies here. You know, Lord Krishna arranged that his whole family, all his children, his grandchildren, would beat each other to death with <laughs> iron sticks. Um, you know, and uh, in the um, in the display of the universal form, Krishna shows. 
Arjuna, that all the, everyone is entering into his mouths and being devoured, everybody, the whole, and Srila Prabhupada is saying in the purport, there's, you know, quotes a verse that says, all the brahmanas, kshatriyas, vaishyas, they're all devoured by time. You know, so this really happens. So we'll, so, bunjana evatma kritam vipakam, we have committed some previous activities by which we got this body, that can be understood philosophically. How did I come here? Why am I something rather than nothing why am i why have i been born in this place rather than in some other place and some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and some people are born on a battlefield but it's because of our past activity we must understand that there's there's some previous cause to this effect and yet we go on enduring it while worshiping the lord and knowing that um, by these examples of other devotees of how the pandavas suffered so much and then Queen Kunti said, I want to go through these calamities again because you always show up to protect us and then I can see you and then, then I know I'll be free from birth and death by seeing you. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a great example that we should all um, learn, not, not that we should suffer. Also the character in American fiction, the character of Uncle Tom, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was, a, it was a great book against slavery, and there was a Christian uh, man who was born a slave, and he was uh, very tolerant and endured suffering. Now later there were these minstrel shows where he was made into almost a cartoon character that he was always just saying, yes, I'll endure any kind of suffering. And it became, you know, by the time I was um, a kid in the, in the 60s, you know, to be call someone an Uncle Tom was to call him someone who was like uh, just tolerating injustices and 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 uh, you know being almost a you know a sycophant to the to the oppressors you know and and instead of fighting against them. So, but um, you know, the actual character in the novel was a strong character with a strong spiritual commitment to to Christianity, and who understood that you know this is a veil of suffering and that we have to um, uh, do our duty no matter what and tolerate no matter what um, and that God will uh, protect us and save us. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the wonderful discourse and especially thank you for touching upon the most misunderstood pastime of Lord Ramachandra. And uh, this is important because um, the doubt should be removed as Krishna also tells in Bhagavad Gita, the doubts actually can devour. So as you beautifully explained how Lord's pastimes are transcendental. So a couple of things I wanted to point out in this pastime. One thing is um, as per technically concerned Banish should be a wrong word to use here because if somebody is exiled, for example, banishment is more stringent than exile. Let's say we are on some visa, our visa is rejected, then we have to leave the country. In this case, Sita was within Ram's kingdom. And second thing is, uh, also Sita was not just left alone somewhere, okay, go to the forest, but she was left under the Balmiki's protection. So indirectly, Lord Ramachandra was still protecting. And the third thing is, Lord's love, as we are saying, this, these loves are not to be, we cannot understand. Lord's love for Sita is so deep that he himself is ready to be misunderstood for eternity, to glorify Sita. When Agni Pariksha, as we rightly pointed out, Lord knew himself that you know, Sita was chaste, she was pure, Still, he asked Agni Pariksha for our sake, so that Sita's purity is uphold and she is glorified for time eternity. Whereas people will blame Lord Ram coming forward in the ages to come. So just like in Krishna, in the battle of Kurukshetra, just to honor the vow of Vishmadev, he is ready to be misunderstood, he took up a, a will so Lord's, because his 
your name bhakta vatsal out of all qualities this quality is the supremely highest quality actually i'm not bhakta vatsal that's someone sorry else. um oh, i'm, I'm extremely sorry bhakta vatsal prabhu i'm remembering him yeah yeah of course he's yeah, a not prabhu right yeah. yes i'm sorry okay. go ahead i'm sorry you're making very good point <laughs> so his quality of this bhakta vatsal comes supremely forward out of all qualities so he his love is so uh, great that he is ready to be misunderstood for time eternity to glorify his devotees in this case also we see that lord ramachandra he is basically prioritizing between kula dharma that is protecting his wife versus rajya dharma and that comes in higher priority and because of that to uphold that he is ready to be misunderstood so it is so tough because one who is responsible he is ready to be misunderstood to take the responsibilities mm. and he's and that's why we see in rama rajya people everybody wants rama rajya but nobody wants to follow the order of lord ram in his rama rajya there was no untimely death there was no you know, bad things were going on because of lord ram because of his great qualities that he is putting such a higher priority and also the other thing is here the the um, the selfless service comes forward here sita is serving selflessly he understood the lord rama's intent and he she honored that and she is selflessly serving she is not complaining because of her selfish things same with lord ram mm-hmm. lord ram is selflessly serving the kingdom even her family because afterwards when there was a asamed yagya conducted so then many people they suggested because the wife is required for the yagna many people suggested why don't you get married uh, one more time because you need a wife so so many excuses to marry lord ram said no i cannot do that is ekapatni bhavan he sh- he loved sita so instead he built sita's uh the dt and that um that dt was used to do the yagna so thank you i really thank you for touching upon uh this uh, this most misunderstood past time and clearing our doubts on the divinity and supremacy of lord ram thank you prabhu hari bol yeah those are very good points i wanted to oh we have some more discussion okay please let's we got time I wanted to uh get to one other verse at the you know about the particular past time because we before we were talking about Sita being kidnapped and then there's another verse in the Bhagavatam describing um Rama's vipralamba after Sita enters the earth but go ahead Hare Krishna Prabhu thank you for such an enlightening class so I have one question and one point to make so my question is uh, these three uh, questions that the gopis ask Krishna Uh, they are quite intriguing and when i first read them it was somewhat puzzling so uh, yeah what are they uh, trying to ask krishna as in which of these three categories he uh, uh, stands in uh, are they trying to hint that he is not uh, reciprocating yes, with them yes they were properly? they were trying to hint that they love him without without reciprocation from him and in a polite way they were asking him as we read in the purport uh, that um do you stand were, in the third category they were category, suggesting huh? that yeah he was he was being indifferent actually the supreme personality of god had has this nature that he's equal to everyone he doesn't favor everyone he, but yet he's baktavatsal so that seems like a contradiction right how can he be not of optimum of optimum no um um you know samo hang sarvabhute shu name dvesho sti na priha um what's the rest of it ye bhajante tum mam bhaktya maite maite te shuchapya ham so uh in the one hand he's completely indifferent right he's perfectly transcendental so he doesn't care about uh favoring anyone he's neutral but that neutrality is expressed by his being extremely affectionate to those who are affectionate to him ye yathamang prapadyante and being uh even disappearing for those of us who wanted to be ignore him or neglect him or to live or to try to be enjoyers without him 
then we got to, he created this whole material world where we can become distracted by so many other interests, right? But um, in a kingdom of Ayodhya, you know, even though this Vipralamba that we're talking about is particular to the conjugal rasa, that even all the devotees have some, are imbued with that, like King Dasarath couldn't live after after sending Ram to the forest, then he was uh, died out of separation. And all the citizens, they weren't just, you know, uh, sad for a couple of days and then they went on. No, they were always, they had seen Rama. They had seen him growing up in the kingdom. They had seen him at the sacrifices at the, in the palace, practicing archery, whatever. And they were always filled with these memories of him and always feeling like, you know, that uh, uh, they wanted him to come back and that strong feeling. So uh, the gopis are asking like that, that, you know, uh, why would, would you be indifferent to us? And he's saying that some people, the impersonalists, right, they become indifferent to everything. They don't want to get, they're afraid. Like Shukadev Goswami didn't want to come out of his mother's womb because he thought, oh, I'll get entangled, right? But then when Krishna came and he heard Srimad Bhagavatam, then uh, he understood that uh, there's something to do, you know. There's, so um, Krishna is, for the yogis, you know, this, when he sits there as the super soul, he's witnessing everything and he's permitting everything, but he doesn't, he's not inserting himself personally. He's just neutral. But for the devotees who worship him as the personality of Godhead, then uh, he actually takes a personal interest. That's what attracts him. Uh, and he, especially the gopis, attract him so much. So then it seems like, well then if the gopis are the best devotees, how can he be so indifferent to them that he leaves them alone? And after they've sacrificed their reputations, their families, everything, the principles of religion, and gone to meet him in the forest and they were so happy, and then all of a sudden he just neglects them. So how could he do that? Is, it, is he that kind of, is he some kind of neutral, indifferent yogi? Or is he some kind of person who's just materially satisfied and doesn't have any feelings? Um, or is he, you know, so the first kind of person was a person who only reciprocates with someone who reciprocates with them. That's most people, you know, love in the material world is a matter of I'll satisfy you as long as you satisfy me. People think I'll love you forever, they get married, but then life becomes tough and they get divorced. You know, that's, we see that going on all the time because it really wasn't based on uh, completely selfless love. It's some, there's some element of selfishness involved. So the ordinary people are like that and ordinary religionists are like that. The karmakanda path is all just, you know, I can enjoy heavenly enjoyment if I follow these principles. And then the second they're describing is themselves, right? We, we uh, love you regardless whether you reciprocate with us or not. And then someone else may not reciprocate with anyone, and not, is completely self-sufficient and doesn't care. They're sort of suggesting that he was like that. But Krishna's not really like that, and then he, he disclosed that. In the chapter of Deliverance of Lord Shiva, uh, the question is there, how come the, the devotees of Lord Shiva become rich and the devotees of Lord Vishnu, even though Vishnu is opulent and Shiva is an ascetic, and they become poor a lot of times. And um, Shukadev Goswami tells how this actually was told by, uh, by Narada Muni to King Yudhishthira that uh, Krishna is actually kinder. He takes away everything from those who he's, he especially favors because he wants to make them perfect in their devotional service. So he takes away all the distractions, the wealth, the family, everybody abandons them and they have no shelter other than Krishna and then they become like abject devotees, completely surrendered to him. And that is actually um, the highest good fortune, even though to the materialist it sounds horrible. You know, oh, I don't want that. I want to live in a palace and have... Uh, servants and good chefs cooking good meals and have lots of comforts and things like that. But um, that's Kushan Lava came back actually to the 
to the um, Ayodhya at some point, and um, I'm trying to remember that story. But they were saying, you know, we're brahmacharis from the forest. We don't need any any uh, uh, opulences of the city. We just, you know, we're completely self-satisfied in the forest like that. So Krishna is revealing that his neglecting, apparently neglecting the gopis, is actually an expression of his love. And he's revealing that their love is so great that there's nothing he could do to reciprocate with them anyway. And then he comes as Lord Chaitanya, and he suffers like them, right? The so-called suffering of them. He demonstrates that that's the highest um, principle, and he actually um, shows them that how he's, he's actually worshipping them by showing how they're the highest uh, devotees. That that mood of uh, service and separation, of love and separation, is actually something that he accepts. He neglects all. Um, when he comes to show that love, he, he becomes a sannyasi. He neglects all material comforts and chases after love of Krishna only. So it's very deep. So I wanted to read this verse. Um, let me see. It's in chapter 11 now. After Let's see. Maybe it's in chapter 12. Yeah, it's in chapter 12 in the dynasty of Kusha. No. Hmm. I should have come more prepared. But, okay, so here it is. Chapter, chapter 11, verse... 15, being forsaken by her husband, this is ninth canto, chapter 11, verse 15, being forsaken by her husband, Sita Devi entrusted her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni. Then, meditating upon the lotus feet of Lord Ramachandra, she entered into the earth. Purport, it was impossible for Sita Devi to live in separation from Lord Ramachandra. Therefore, after entrusting her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni, she entered into the earth. Text eight, uh, 16, after hearing the news of Mother Sita's entering the earth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead was certainly aggrieved. Although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, upon remembering the exalted qualities of Mother Sita, he could not check his grief in transcendental love. Purport, Lord, Ch Lord Ramachandra's grief at the news of Sita Devi's entering the earth is not to be considered material. In the spiritual world also there are feelings of separation but such feelings are considered spiritual bliss. Grief and separation exists even in the absolute, but such feelings of separation in the spiritual world are transcendentally blissful. Such feelings are a sign of tasya prema vashyatva svabhava, being under the influence of ladini shakti and being controlled by love. In the material world, such feelings of separation are only a perverted reflection. So, those who relish mundane literature, they, all, they often relish these stories of betrayal and um, abandonment and uh, longing, right? The, the Portuguese uh, fado singers always sing about the uh, saudade, the, the longing when, the, when one's uh, beloved. Of course, they, they were a seafaring nation and people, the husbands were always going off to sea and not coming back for a long time. And the, um, I was hearing one Irish band that sang Irish, traditional Irish ballads and things. And they were asked to sing at a wedding and they were asked to sing something that had a happy ending. And the singer was thinking, we couldn't think of any songs. <laughs> all the love songs had some unhappy ending. They were all songs of betrayal and loss and, and uh, grief. But in the mundane world, this is a painful experience, even though it's an it's a emotion that people relish of, um, and it's the essence of tragedy that, that uh, someone survives through their, through their, you know, they have a fatal flaw, but that nevertheless, 
uh, they persist and they have to die for it, and that transcends. So this is this is mundane literature, but spiritual literature is something completely different. Yadvag, what is it? Janataka viplavo yasmin prati shlokam abadhavatipi namanyanantasya shon kitani yat shrinvanti gayanti grinanti sadhavaha. Spiritual literature is something different. Uh, uh, holy people aren't really interested in those Irish ballads and the Portuguese songs of longing, uh, but they're interested in the longing and the separation song of the gopis, um, because that's a different kind of um, uh, grief, a different kind of uh, saudage, you might say, a different kind of missing your beloved. It's completely spiritual. It's not affected by um, selfishness. It's not affected by sense gra material sense gratification, but it's actually an expression of love for the absolute supreme personality of Godhead. So, yes, Prabhu, one more, and then I think it's time. At, we're going to go to bhajans at 9.30. Okay. So even in um, the material world, when p two people are in truly love, uh, and uh, there is separation, there is some vairagya, like they are, uh, the person who is feels separated doesn't want to enjoy senses or eat food or like, so it has very, uh, like, and that's kind of usually categorized as true love. But it's not really true love. And uh, I'm sorry to say, you know, a lot of people love to feel like there's really true love in the material world, but it's a semblance of the spiritual love. And yes, it's a good, it does create vairagya. In fact, that's when Narada Muni came to ki preach to King Chitraketu. First, the other sage came, Angira, I forget who it was, but King Chitraketu couldn't have a son. And he longed for a son, couldn't have a child. He had millions of wives. He, was a, he wasn't a human, he was a um, charana or a no, vidyadhara. He was a vidyadhara, so in the heavenly planets. And uh, he uh, finally, by the mercy of a sage, he gave some special, you know, sweet rice to his to his uh, favorite queen, and then he was able to have a son. But then the other wives became envious, and they killed the son, poisoned the little baby, and then he was like, couldn't even maintain consciousness. But this was material, material uh, grief. And he couldn't maintain consciousness, and he was falling down and weeping. And, and then the sage came back along with Narada Muni. And uh, Narada Muni brought the child back to life. And the child was saying, why are you crying? You know, I've had many, many parents. I'm born again and again. And they spoke philosophy to him and enlightened him. And this is described that it's a good time to preach to someone when they've experienced some material loss they do have this sense of vairagya, that what does it all mean, what have, you know, all the things that they were so attached to, thinking were so important, become questioned and then they become open-minded. So Narada Muni tried the same technique with uh, Daksha, right? Daksha had, was trying to populate the universe with good progeny, and so he would send his sons off to perform austerities so they would develop good qualities. And then Narada Muni would come, and first there was a thousand of them, and Narada Muni came and convinced them all to just become Naishtiki Brahmacharis and go Paramahansa yogis. And then there were 10,000 of them, the Haryashvas. And Narada Muni, then he again convinced them to give up everything. So then when Daksha was lamenting that he could, all his 10,100 sons had been taken away, Narada Muni thought, oh, maybe now he's, he's feeling some vairagya and he'll listen to me. But he wouldn't. He couldn't give up his sense that you know, Narada Muni was the one who had convinced them. You know, Daksha was very determined to carry out his duty. which He had actually been given blessing by Krishna to carry out the duty of populating the world with good population. And he couldn't uh, listen to Narada Muni's preaching. He just cursed Narada Muni that... Uh, so Narada Muni, I forget what the curse, he couldn't stay in one place for more than three days and there were some different curse which Narada Muni accepted. This is a pastime of the great personalities of the universe. But yeah, it's true that when uh, that love that we feel, 
and that affection for our family, it's a strong bond, and of course, it's useful in, you know, in morality of human society, that people should at least be, they shouldn't be indifferent to one another and so forth, but for a higher purpose they can be. That's an interesting, that, that ex example of Narada Muni and Daksha was a good example, because Narada Muni, because Daksha was pointing out, you're going against the principles of religion. Every person has a duty to satisfy the ancestors, the demigods, the Vedas. They have to get married and have other children for the ancestors. They have to perform sacrifices for the demigods, and they have to study the Vedas. They have to perform those duties. But Narada Muni was teaching from a higher principle, this... this uh, Nivriti Marg, that actually if they completely surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they don't have to do those things. So from ordinary morality point of view, we need people to be affectionate towards their families. Otherwise, they, they, would, they would be like animals, right? But higher than that, you know, like when, when Queen Kunti is praying to Krishna, she's saying, sever my ties of affection to my family. And who is her family? Her family is... The Vrishni dynasty, you know, the, the greatest devotees. But she's teaching this principle, the highest principle, that if we want to actually become enlightened devotees of Krishna, we shouldn't have that kind of... Um, we should recognize that I'm not the body, and that things related to this body aren't really mine, and they're temporary anyway, and everyone's going to die here. And um, So... Nar uh, Narada Muni explains to King Yudhishthir in the seventh canto about Varnashram Dharma, that the enlightened devotee, sh even though he's unattached, should go on at least playing the role as long as he's in the, in, in the situation. Oh, so Krishna's telling Arjuna also, as long as he's in the situation. If you really know you're not that body, it doesn't mean you just sit down and do nothing. It means you do what you're supposed to do with that body. You don't, you don't neglect what you're supposed to do um, because um, because uh, the, out, of, out of finding it inconvenient or something like that, that's actually affected by the modes of nature. But in the mode of goodness, you do what you're supposed to do while you have no um, illusion about, how you're, about your actual spiritual identity. And um, so I know I'm go I've gone over time, but I want to say one thing that I actually, someone asked me to, to officiate at a marriage one time, and I mentioned this. Actually, here I mentioned it when one of the devotees was getting married. That Vaisheshika was asked about that, that a devotee um, a devotee's not supposed... We heard in class that a devotee's not supposed to be more affectionate to their own children than to any other... anyone, anyone else's children. Right? I and mean, that's astounding, right? But a, an enlightened person... So I was asking, but how could that be? That would seem you would seem like a horrible parent, if you know you didn't care more about your own kids than somebody else's kids. And he was explaining that um, that it seems funny to people. Of course, the devotees play the role of being affectionate parents and take care of their, and they have great affection for their kids. But it's based on their spiritual uh, identities. But the great, I mean, the great devotees. But he said, he gave an example of a devotee whose uh, family couldn't understand that she had become a devotee and she had given up their ambition for her to, you know, make money and get married and carry on the dynasty and whatever they, whatever they had the idea of a successful family life, they, they were angry that she had become a devotee. But then when the, um, when the mother became very, very sick and needed to be cared for, and needed like a full-time nurse, and um, the other members of the family couldn't do it. But they were they had too many other obligations and too many other attachments, and they and they couldn't even deal with um, the um, you know ghastliness of taking care of a very sick person, helping them stay clean, and help you know. But this devotee was able to do it because she was transcendental. So that then, then they then they finally appreciated that uh, you know you, we thought that you had rejected our family, but we see that you developed these qualities that really helped our family very much. So a devotee actually loves. It's not that a devotee loves less, loves their own family less. 
It said they love they have a they have a non exclusive kind of love that they see spirits so that everyone is a servant of Krishna, everyone is a spark of Krishna, everyone is a okay, we got bhajans coming now. Everyone is a uh uh part of Krishna like the Christian philosophy, love your neighbor as yourself, that you should love everyone as a spark of God and therefore they should be in, you can't heart anyone or disturb anyone because then you would be disturbing Krishna. Of course, you have to carry out your duties sometimes, like Arjuna had to oppose others in battle and so forth. But that a devotee loves even more. They can actually love their family by giving them Krishna consciousness rather than misleading their family into becoming materialistic people who are only interested in in uh, sense gratification that will actually lead them to hell. A devotee can be more affectionate by being affectionate on the you know with knowledge of the difference between spirit and matter and all the all the gyan that we need to know to actually live a successful life so a devotee can really love their own family best while loving everyone else so vaisheshika said that and i always remember that that it's that so to have your kids get married to devotees Hare krishna <laughs>